I'm back, drums. <laughs> I'm gonna hit each and every one of you, and I don't know what positions I'm gonna play. I'm just gonna play it. Let's see what we have here. <laughs> Man, you, you were making love to that drum set. It's funny you say that. <laughs> that to me is really what a relationship is. This was kind of an out of solo context of playing, it was kind of getting to know the kid, and that's really what it is. We need to have 
a relationship with the drums, because they are an extension of who we are. Yeah. It's about fun, yeah. it's about expression. This is totally what this is all about. <laughs> Having fun and expressing who you are, your individual self, into the instrument. This is huge. <laughs> Jared, it's great to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dom <laughs> Famula. 20 years ago, 20 years ago, this year, uh, I guess it was nine, whatever. I'm 36, so it was, I was 16 is when I first met you on wow. a drum set at a festival. I told you yesterday. <laughs> and the fact that you are sitting here today and I was watching you play that solo is literally just like blowing my mind. Wow. So thank you from, from myself, especially, and everyone at Drumeo for being a part of this. Thank you for having me here. You know, I've heard as I travel around the world all about what you guys are doing here. Mm -hmm. It is fantastic what you're doing here. You are inspiring people, you are leading them on a path of drumming, which is what this journey is all about. Right. We share this passion, for everyone listening all around the world, we share this passion of loving this instrument and having a relationship with the sounds that are here. These sounds are a part of my voice. You know, art is about expression. Yeah. Music is the language that we choose, but drums, this is our voice, and each of you has a voice, and the object now is to discover that voice and then share it. Right. That's the journey. Yes, absolutely. So if you don't know who Dom is, Dom is known as Drumming's Global Ambassador. <laughs> he literally travels the world. How, how many countries this year? Th this year so far, about, um, I think, 19. I have uh, uh, seven more left before the end of the year. Right. So you, you are an author. You've been an educator for 48 years. Yeah. A clinician, motivational <laughs> speaker, entrepreneur. You're a host. Obviously, you're a drummer. And, 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 and don't forget the George Clooney lookalike. <laughs> George Clooney lookalike. Yeah, thank you very much. And he's the host, the host of the Sessions panel. Um, you got to check out more of Dom. So everything's at his website. So yeah. go to domfamularo.com. You yeah. can see all of his books and everything else that he's doing. I guess your schedule will be posted there as well. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, you can follow him on Instagram. It's at global2dom. Facebook is slash domfamularo. And YouTube is global drumming. Big shout out to all the companies that, that sponsor you here. Absolutely, man. These are companies that, that I, I, I love them dearly because they support education. Right. Aside from making fantastic product. Mapex drums, this is their Saturn series, which is a multi-layered wood. I love the, the fact that the shell is very thin, but they strengthen it with extra, you know, different types of wood inside. So yeah. it's a thin shell that's strong. So I get a great sound all the time, and I get a new kit wherever I travel around the world. Right. So I'm excited to have the fact that I can I have the luxury of this great product being made. Right. Sabian Symbols, I've been with Sabian Symbols this January, will be 30 years with this company. Wow. This is one of my original sets that I have. And I brought them here because they sound fantastic. Yeah. In all these 30 years, I play the cymbals. I am also not kind on the cymbals, and I've never broken a cymbal in 30 years. So wow. the flexibility and the sounds and the tones and how I've chosen them is a big part of who I am. Well, so. you definitely make love to the cymbals. I was just watching this yeah. little relationship here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. These, and these little guys. It's like spray water at you yeah. and cool you down. <laughs> cool me down. Right? Throw a bucket of water on that drummer. What's amazing about it is, is, and I have this set up with my Sabian cymbals, I've got two ride cymbals. I've got an HH stage ride to my right and an evolution that was um, created by Weckl, which is you know, Dave Weckl, who's just a, a brilliant, brilliant mind, and not only as a player and a musician, but as just a creator of sounds. And the evolution series here, so I've got the HHX and two ride cymbals allows me to play right hand lead or left hand lead. Yeah. And that's an important part that we'll even talk about that later on. Yeah. I've got two splash cymbals, a 10 and a 12 inch splash to my left. I put them to my left so I have to utilize my left side more yeah. to get in there. I've got two crashes in front of me, um, 17 inch each, but they're different tones and um, of the HHX. And I've got my um, 18 inch Chinese cymbal here, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, en enough so I can attack it. And it's there for that reason. Right. And I've got a 20 inch Chinese symbol in the back here, so I can then resolve the sounds of what I'm looking for with that right. sound. And two hi hats, 14 inch to my right, and 15 inch HHX to my left. So it allows me to have this orchestra of sounds from symbols. So Sabian just, it just constantly has impressed me through all these years and right. just, just the quality of standard. Drum heads, I play, I've been playing Evans for many years. They are just a great quality product. The D'Addario company, when they put their DNA into a product, the Evans UV1s I'm playing here now, the yeah. Level 360 heads on how they've manufactured for them to sit better on the shelves is just brilliantly designed. I get a great sound consistently, easy to tune. They hold their tuning. 
more than I've ever experienced in my life yeah, of playing all these years. Mm -hmm. And um, and Promark sticks. I've been with Promark now for several years, and they are just fantastic. They're designing a new stick for me now that I'm going to have in my own uh, model. And um, the quality of products, and we have on here the Active Grip, yeah. which is a little bit tacky, and I, I really kind of like that, so I put yeah. the clear Active Grip on my sticks, and because of the tackiness, it just kind of, how it sits in my hand is just comfortable for yeah. me to, to hold it. Yeah. And you shred them, like I saw flakes of wood coming oh, out of it, it's, it, well, you know, and, and it, 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 which is what you should happen, because right. we're playing, you know, when people ask me what I do for a living, I tell them, I hold wood in my hands, and I strike metal and plastic, and I make noise. Right. And when they say, well, how, how do you make money? I tell them when I organize the noise. <laughs> it's kind of what we do when you think yes. about it. It's what we do. Breaking it down. <laughs> um, okay, so for this lesson, it's eventually gonna be on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube now, congratulations. We're gonna do a little bit of a contest. So 30 days after the release of this lesson, we're gonna choose three random winners from the comments section below. All you have to do is comment what your favorite part about the lesson is, and I'm sure it won't, won't be hard to find a favorite part. Two of you are each gonna receive a pair of Dom's signature pad sticks. Oh, cool. Actually, very cool pad sticks. I just tried them out before, uh, and <laughs> I've, I've never really used different sticks for the pad, and yeah. I, I love them. And I know you, you bought me a pair too, so <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna try them out. Uh, we're also gonna give away one lucky person his book, The Cycle of Self-Empowerment, which he was just telling me a little bit about before we got started. Uh, also, I kept a copy for myself, which I'm going to read. <laughs> uh, you're you're going to get the pad sticks, and then this is pretty incredible. This is cool. This, this is, is this. pretty incredible. Uh, Ross, get a close-up on this. Uh, so Dom really helped Jim Chapin out in the publishing of his book and, and has carried on some of the publishing of those materials. And the book, Advanced Techniques for the Modern Drummer, this is the last run. Of the, of the self-printed, uh, self-published self books, yeah. And he, yeah. Jim Chapin has signed all of these. One of you will get uh, this signed book, which yeah. I mean, I. Again, we're keeping one for myself, <laughs> selfishly, and I, I want to frame it and put it on the wall here because I think it's like this is this is an incredible piece of drumming history. And so, yeah. uh, all you need to do to be entered to win is just leave a comment below. I mean, come on, it's 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 kind of ridiculously simple. Leave a oh, comment yeah. below. We'll throw it all in the hat and we'll we'll choose three Good. of you and ship you that stuff at no charge. So, Dom. This, I feel like, I, I, I still feel like it's a little bit surreal that you're here. And I, I, I was so nervous, like even to pick you up and everything, it's cause, because I took master class from you way back. Remember in, years ago you'd come to the, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, I, yeah. And, and I, was just, I was just a little kid. I remember you grabbing my arm and throwing up the house. I'm like, well, who is this guy, man? I was like, that, my arm's kind of so no. But you know, you really, you really helped me with my technique and you really helped me understand uh, the techniques that I need in order to play this drum, the, yeah. the, the drums for a long time without any pain or with, you know, and really just helped me become more of myself on, the, on this instrument. Which is, which is the most important part too, right. for you to understand the movement so you can become who you want to be. Right. That's what this, this, I don't want anyone to play like me. I don't want to play like anyone else. I want to discover who I am right. and let that come out and see where that goes. Right. So in this lesson, and, and actually before this, I want to, um, Jim Bailey, I just want to recognize the Diodario Education yeah. Collective because he, he was instrumental in helping putting this together and Jim's a great guy. Um, so that's the last of that. Now we're going to get to the, the lesson, if that's okay. Absolutely. Practical man. techniques for the 21st century <laughs> modern drummer. That sounds so deep. We know what, you know what I'm <laughs> worried about though is what's going to happen when we're in the 22nd century is this lesson still going to be relevant well believe it or not interesting that these techniques kind of came evolved from the beginning parts of when drum had happened when, they, right. when people started playing drums and that as the techniques evolved the fundamentals of movement will always remain the same right as long as we are holding something in our hand and striking it to create sound right. those movements are going to be needed and and it changes i mean as we've got involved in more powerful playing as music has changed some of the bigger arm motions of techniques, which is you know, you know George Lawrence Stone and Moeller, these, these techniques have even become more predominant now. Right. So I believe as music changes in the later part of the 21st century as, and as drumming continues, it will be relevant. Oh yeah. It will be. For sure. So yeah, we're gonna talk about um, some of these techniques and if you're thinking, oh, technique, boring, boring, I think even the awareness of them is important, if you, even if you don't necessarily sit down and practice them. So, Heed his words. I think I think they're they're so important. Yeah. And plus, you're, they're coming from a guy who's unbelievably qualified. I mean, just go and go and look up the biography if, if you need to. Um, so, Dom, go ahead. You wanted to talk about uh, natural grip. Absolutely. First. So let's start there. The, the first thing is about about technique. Yeah. And and 
the ultimate place we want to go is to play music. I'll talk to this camera here. We want to, no. we want to play music. Sure. Over here? Yeah, the right camera over okay. there. Okay. Yeah. You, you want to, we want to play music. It's about expression and the feel. And if you sit down and you're playing and you're having fun, good or bad technique, it doesn't matter. If you're having fun, you win. So we want to start there. There's got to be this fun factor. I have fun after 52 years of playing drums. I'm still, professionally, I'm still enjoying the journey of learning and it's still fun. So the fun factor has to start there first. Second is the fact of technique. Technique gets kind of a bad rap because we think it's about, you know, the, 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 the you know, too technical of a thought process. It's not. Technique is the movement that we create to play this instrument. Mm -hmm. So I say relaxed movement creates relaxed sound. Fluid movement creates fluid sound. Consistent movement creates consistent sound. Tense movement creates tense sound. So we want to remove the tension and work towards relaxed, fluid, consistent movement. Mm -hmm. If we have that, then the fun factor is, is, is more enjoyable that we can play and just feel what we can feel and express it. There's nothing right. better than having an idea in your head. You can hear it clearly and you're able to express it. How many out there, just by a raise of hands, and we can see you. Yes, we, we can absolutely. see each and every one of you. Yes. By a raise of hands, how many of you have ever had an idea clearly in your head, you can hear the idea on the drums, you hear it in your head crystal clear, when you go to play it, it sounds like you're falling down a flight of steps. We've all been there, all right? Mm -hmm. The object is, imagine if you had the freedom to be able to express what you had in your head comfortably and relaxed, that you could just do it and enjoy the moment. That's the part of it. So, Papa Joe Jones, I happened to meet him at the professional drum shop in New York, mm -hmm. and I asked him about holding the stick in his hand, what's a way to hold the stick? If we start with a natural position. Right. And I thought I was gonna get this long explanation as far as you know where to put the finger and the index and the thumb and the finger. He said to me, he said, Dom, just take the stick and flip it back in your hand, relax your hand, don't squeeze it, and freeze. Right. That becomes the grip. So try that, Jerry, just take it, flip it back, and let, so notice, now freeze. Notice how your hand has grabbed it. Right. The flat part of your thumb is on it, which we call the pad of your thumb. Mm -hmm. Your index finger is relaxed. So that position of how you're holding the stick is your natural position to grab that. Mm -hmm. If you grab it and squeeze, tension is unnatural. So not like this. Exactly right, right? <laughs> so tension is, is not, we're not born tense. Right. So tension is not really a natural part of our, of our, of our learned process. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, we, we acquire that later on many times because of ignorance or because of fear. Right. So with that, if I flip the stick and I hold it in my hand, that's the grip. So we start there with that grip, that natural grip in our hand. So what, and what again, do you say with people that say about like fulcrum and all this like that bounce point? About we get into that all later on. Okay. And that's where it gets technical. There are four different fulcrum positions of right. where that stick will move. Just holding it in your hand naturally is a good place to start. And you can think about fulcrums later on. But fulcrum, for example, if the beginning part of the index finger in the first crevice, when it's there, that's called the control grip, yeah. classically used. If I move my index finger up to the second joint, that is called the power grip. Mm. When I go to the middle finger, that's the mid hand, mm. the mid fulcrum, and if I go back to here, that's the back hand fulcrum. Right. And that position is what Mola had come up with, and Tony Williams used that a lot. Tony, who had like a 24 inch ride symbol, used to be back here, there's a lot of video you can see on the internet of Tony playing here <laughs> to get power. Right. And, and it's back in here, so this way none of your smaller fingers are taking the shock. So when I'm going to my Chinese symbol, and I'm hitting here, let me just show you this here for a second here. Yeah. If I'm play, play, playing here, and just kind of, Hold your ears for a second, because with this yeah. here. <laughs> and that was the ballad. <laughs> That was the slower, the slow dance song. So that motion, to allow me to get to that level of intensity, yeah. I've got to ask my hand to get me the position that will allow me to get there, but be relaxed. Mm. So now you can, you can combine power and relaxation, hmm. which is like an oxymoron. Right. Power and relaxation, those words don't go together. Right. Kind of like, almost like, you know, military intelligence. I'm not sure those words go together, okay? Or, or, or words like, Happily married. I'm not sure they go together, you know. My wife is happy. I'm married. I mean, I, I don't understand all this here. So 
kidding around for sure. But you can see that that's the level of two words that can mix together yeah. that can create that power. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the next. You wanted to talk a little bit about the grips. Yes. Uh, I like how you explained this to me earlier, and I want you to hopefully try and replicate it. Oh, this is great. This is, um, and, and again, just quickly, just to get a feel for the process. What I learned in time was that, that um, and, and the reason why the pad sticks is only because my teachers, uh, you know, Murillo, Chapin, Shelley Mann, all these great, great teachers, mm -hmm. Al Miller, Ronnie Benedict, Charlie Perry, these guys were just great, great, great teachers. They all used what was at the time called the Bunkin 3S, which was a big stick. So I found a Bunkin 3S, designed a stick like that, and they used it because it was a maple wood, so it was light, yeah. but big with a round tip, so you had to over-exaggerate the movement. Mm. So they practiced with that Bunkin 3S stick to over-exaggerate the movement. Mm. So the first position I would say to understand is Germanic position. In Germanic position, my elbows are relaxed, Germanic is palms down, the stick is at a 90 degree angle. Now we practice here, not necessarily because we're gonna play in Germanic around the drum set, but we're gonna develop the 13 muscles available in our arm mm. to give me the stretch so when I need that position, I'm comfortable. So that's the first part of Germanic position. And that position is here, in that position. Again, relax with that natural grip. Second is French grip position. Now the Germanic position came because the German drummers at that time, back in the 17 and 1800s, were playing very powerful Germanic harsh music. Mm -hmm. The music was militaristic, dun 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 dun, and those were the love songs. Okay, <laughs> it was amazing to experience. They were playing this harsh music, so the, those drummers needed to play this position yeah. to get the volume they needed to still be relaxed. Yeah. Then the French came in, and the French music was like romanticized. It was romantic music as la da 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 da. It was beautiful music. The French wanted to drink wine and make love. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what they. So that's really how the French live. So they they went to this grip, the French grip position, which has six muscles out of the thirteen muscles available, and this motion is here. The sticks are parallel. And with that motion, still relax, index finger relax in that motion, and I can play either from my wrist or from my fingers here. Mm -hmm. So I've got two options in French grip position. Third was the American grip. In the American grip, the sticks are at a 45 degree angle. And this was important because this was kind of labeled by Gene Krupa. I got the story from, from Joe Morello and um, verified by Chapin and Shelley Mann, and the fact that Gene was doing clinics back in the, in, in the early 30s and, and, and 40s. He was the first one to do clinics. Mm -hmm. He was the first one to write a drum set book. He was the first one to star in over, over 100 movies <laughs> that he's in. Gene also was the first one to put together a school back in the 50s with Cozy Cole, which had like over 300 students a week. At that time, two drum sets in the room, very advanced concept of what we did. And uh, Gene was at a clinic one day and his stand was on an angle. So he was playing traditional grip and he was playing. And as he was playing at this clinic, questions were asked. They said, Gene, you've got a beautiful traditional grip in your left hand. Your right hand, is that German or French? This was like in the 40s now, World War II. So Gene was, he looked at his hand. He said, well, German would have been out to here and French would be in here. So this grip is in between the French and Germans it's the American grip. And that, he just kind of said that, really? and that stuck. Hmm. So it stuck because at that 45 degree angle now, that motion People say, well, that's really where they're most comfortable at. Yeah. So when I teach, I say, well, that's good that your American grip is comfortable. Let's work on French and German because you're gonna apply these grips on the drum set. And that's where this gets really, really, you know, gets pretty cool. In the fact that now I might play I might play French grip, French grip. So there's, there's a, if there's a groove and a feel that I feel, I'm playing with this song and I need that feel, I just might be here. French, French. Right. I might play American, American going around the drums. German, German would be out to here. 
a little weirder. Mm -hmm. But what happens if I'm playing on my ride cymbal and I'm in French and I'm in American here? Mm -hmm. If I don't practice those positions and train those muscles, I am not prepared to go to that position comfortably. So I've had drummers say to me, Don, listen, I'm taking lessons, I wanna work on, 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 on these movements, but I don't, wanna, I don't wanna work on French grip. I don't play French grip. Right. And I'll say, well, it, it's good to know, Don, I don't wanna learn French grip. I'll say, okay, well, great, no problem. Just show me when you go to the ride cymbal, how you play the ride cymbal, and they'll do this. And I'll go, wait a second, and they'll go, whoa. Whoa, it's French. I say, yeah, it's French. On the kit, you're gonna use these positions when you're playing, and I might play French grip on my ride cymbal, and I might play German and American, and I might move around, so I want that freedom mm -hmm. to get around the kit comfortably. For example. Within that, I played all those three positions. Yeah. Now, I'm not thinking about, I'm gonna to go to French, I'm gonna to go to American, here's my German, hit the crit. I'm not thinking at that point. The object is to get this motion into your body, much like we do the English language, and how we learn vowels and consonants and conjunctions. We learn all the fundamentals of the language, but when I speak, I'm not thinking of the conjunctions that I speak. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes if I ask someone to name me five conjunctions, they look at me and they don't know. I said, well, you've used them in our conversation. Conjunctions, and, but, or, for, nor. When you understand what they are, now you just use them naturally, and that's what technique is about. Right, so, so when it comes to like the practice or development of these, do you think it's then more uh, having a knowledge and being aware of them, as opposed to saying, I'm gonna practice my Germanic grip today? and I'm gonna practice my French grip today. Both, great question. Yeah. I think on a practice pad, which is a fundamental understanding of the development of our muscles, mm -hmm. on the practice pad, go through the book Stick Control, mm -hmm. and if you're going through it on a regular basis, one day practice it in Old German, and then, that, then the same page, maybe the next day practice it in French, and the next day practice it in American. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of let those muscles develop. Then when you get the, the, the actual drum kit, forget about it, Right. just play. But on the fundamental, stretching and developing part of learning it on that practice pad, be a little bit more conscious of it and work out of a book like Stick Control, which is you know, the greatest hand technique book in the world, yeah. that not only will we talk about going through it with your hands, but I'm gonna, I, I went through it with my feet. Yeah. When people ask me about how I got my feet where they are, I went through Stick Control one page a week, one minute each exercise, one page a week, 24 minutes a page, 42 pages of that book, 42 weeks. I went through it, the entire book with Morello in full strokes. Right. We finished the book, we went through it in half strokes. We finished the book, we went through it in low strokes. We went through it with fingers. It was amazing. And then I went through it with my feet. 42 weeks with right. my feet. So I say to somebody when they want to work on feet development, they'll say, well, gee, how do I get my feet to a higher level? Well, it's going to take that practice. I did it through stick control. So if you want to achieve kind of what I've achieved, you got to follow the same practice routine. Right. And I can guarantee you. 42 weeks working with your feet. You're not gonna have many questions about your feet when right. you're finished. You're gonna know how to play your feet. Yeah. So then can, can you play the, the drums, uh, or is it okay to play the drums without using any of these positions? Like, is it even possible? It, it is not possible, because on the drum set, because of right cymbal, toms, and snare, how we have it set up, your hand positions have to change. Mm -hmm. They have to change. So when I see drummers who are working, and sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll be playing on the cymbal in, in French grip, and, and their time is not that good, and they're playing, and, and they'll say, Don, my, my time's not good, I've got like a glitch in my playing. Mm -hmm. I'll say, well, your French grip is kind of tense, it's not working smoothly. And I can see when you're playing. So that means if you went back and practiced more on that French grip and got those muscles developed, yeah. when you got to the right cymbal, you'd feel better. Yeah. It, this is all about the feel, this is all about the touch of the yeah. symbol, so why not learn the, the nuance of touch? Listen, when a doctor, when a brain surgeon, or an open heart surgery surgeon goes to learn, they study the, the scalpel at many levels. They have to learn many different techniques of positions mm. to study, and they practice on cadavers, which is kind of like our practice pad. Right. <laughs> it's a practice pad, it's a heck of a lot <laughs> more fun to play with. And they cut these incisions to learn the techniques so when they get to the actual gig, they are, have the ability of the muscle power and strength 
to make the incision correctly. Yeah. So other other sense. other crafts go through it. We just have to learn that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Can we move on? Yeah, absolutely, man. Thank God you didn't have a cadaver here because it would have been <laughs> these ugly. Next, these next <laughs> topics could, could get deep. Because, <laughs> because it's not something that I've seen talked about uh, that much, especially from someone like you. So let's go into Gladstone. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, these, these three guys, I had the chance of going to hear Max Roach play. In, you yeah. know, I, I live you know, outside of New York City. And um, in the early days, in the, in the early 70s and late 60s, all these great, you know, legendary players that are now gone now, we're all performing on a regular basis. And I'd go to hear Max Roach one night at, at, the, at the Village Vanguard, then walk across the street to Storytown and hear Elvin play, and then go to Storyville and hear Tony Williams play, right. then go to 7th Avenue South and hear Steve Gadd play. So it was easy to kind of walk around and check all these guys. And Max once said to me, I, I said to him after a performance, I said, Max, gosh, you played so great, you played so relaxed and fluid and expressive. How'd you learn all that stuff? Mm -hmm. And he leaned over to me and said, Billy Gladstone, George Lawrence Stone, and Sanford Moeller. Hmm. Now, in 1971, I was 18 years old. I didn't really know much of what that meant. I knew George Lawrence Stone from the book Stick Control. So I said, well, what does that mean? He goes, those are three different movements of techniques that if you understand that, it'll give you freedom. Hmm. Now think about that, coming from someone like Max Roach that said, if you understand those movements, it will give you freedom. We want freedom. I want the freedom of expression. Yeah. We live in a, in, in countries that give us this chance to have this freedom of expression, and I want to have that ability to get around the kids. So, Gladstone was, he played all different types of wrist and arm motion, but his focus was fingers. And his finger motion was here. It was, it was a motion where these three fingers are propelling that stick. Mm -hmm. So here's an exercise that I got from Shelly Mann. First lesson, 1976. I go to Shelly Mann, we go on a lesson. He says to me, Don, put your fingers like this. I want you all to do this now. Put your fingers in this position, so your thumb and your index finger. Jared, you do this too. Thumb and index finger here, and stretch these three fingers up, and you're gonna bring the finger all the way down, and then all the way up. Now you're not gonna curl them, you're gonna bring them all the way down, yes, and all, you're gonna stretch them. Now you want the thumb and index finger to be relaxed, so there's no squeezing. Right. So here's the tempo I want you all to do with it. You ready? One and two and three and oh, four and one and two and three and four and one. And keep doing that. Do not stop until I tell you. Now, you got to trust me here. Trust me. I, I, I play a doctor in the movies. Just trust me, okay? <laughs> in this process, while you're doing this here, this is what Shelly Man began to explain to me. Now, I'm doing this. Keep doing this while I'm speaking because this is what he did it. And just so you know, in my first lesson with him, I did this for an hour. My tongue was hanging down to my socks. You did it for an hour? One hour. I oh was begging for forgiveness. <laughs> and Shelly just said, keep going while he talked to me. And what happened is, now while you're doing this, look at your arm and look at how much movement's going on in those muscles just from those three fingers. Remember, do not squeeze thumb and index finger. Keep doing this. Come on, keep it's doing this. There's it's no a, stopping. Come on. The tempo's too fast. And three, and well, I'm pushing you a little fast here. So keep it going now. In this process, two things are happening that I want you to be aware of. The difference between muscle Tension and muscle development. Keep going now, keep, keep going. Muscle tension is when the muscle tightens up, stops the blood from flowing, and shuts down the joint of movement. If this was muscle tension, you would have a cramp right now, you would not be able to continue, but you can continue. Yes, it's dis there's discomfort, but you can continue, right? You can, you're working it, right? I can see, you're, looking, you're starting to turn red. If, if Jared falls over, we're gonna continue. We're gonna keep going, even if he's on the floor right now. So Everyone else better be doing this, otherwise yes. you're all fired. <laughs> In this process, now, while you're doing this here. Now, the second thing is, is the yes. development of muscle. <laughs> he's doing it. In the booth. The second one that Shelly talked about was muscle development. Now, this is important now. Keep doing this. Muscle development means now you're starting to stretch the muscle, and as you pull the muscle and stretch it, it gets stronger. A longer muscle is a stronger muscle. So you're pulling, you're actually kind of pumping the blood into the muscle while it's stretching. This is what you're feeling. Now, you're still doing it. Is it getting a little easier? A little bit. It's a little easier, which means the muscles are starting to get comfortable to the stretch. If you kept on doing this, you would feel dramatically different in how better that would happen. Okay, now, stop right there. Oh, thank you. Stop right there. Shake your hands out. Shake your hands out. And now do this. Shake your hands out. Now that you've shaked your hands up for a few seconds, do it again. Oh. Do it again. Tell me what you feel. Uh, death. <laughs> <laughs> 
you might start to feel a little easier. It, it, it did start feeling easier before I stopped. Right? Yeah. Okay, hold it right there. So what this is, is this is an exercise of finger movement. So the, the finger motion is in here. If I show this here, the fulcrum's here, and I'm just flicking these three fingers. And there are so many great drummers that play that way. Billy Cobham, okay. uh, Simon Phillips, <laughs> fantastic French grip finger position, uh, Sonny Emery, Jerry Brown. Yeah. Uh, so many great, great players that just have a, grit, a good feel for getting around the kit in that position. And that's, again, one tool of what these three masters taught. Right. It's a tool. And like I say, I have three different hammers that I use that when I work around the house, I've got three different hammers. I've got a little tack hammer, mm -hmm. which is a small, a small hammer with a little bead on it, and when I want to fix a picture frame, I tap on the picture frame with a little tack nail, and I use that hammer for that picture frame so I don't ruin the frame. Yeah. I have, then I have a framing hammer, which is a bigger hammer with a bigger head. I get a bigger nail, and I have a bigger motion with a bigger hammer to create a bigger result. Mm -hmm. For the same reason, I also have a sledgehammer where you, you literally, it's got a big head on it, and when you want to break cement, you bring it above your head and you crack the cement. Now the question is, would you ever use the tack hammer to break the cement? It would be foolish. You could, it would take you a long time. Would you ever use the sledgehammer to fix the picture frame? Well, it would be awkward, you know. So the point is using the right tool at the right time, but you have to own the tools to know what tool to use. Right. So owning the position of finger motion and this motion That's fingers. Mm -hmm. This would be wrist. Yeah. Notice the fingers were a lighter sound, smaller muscles, wrists were a little bit more powerful sound. Mm -hmm. So it's just a tool of positioning, and Gladstone was just a master of that, and there are so many great players. John Riley, Danny Gottlieb, there are so many great players out there that are great educators that understand this, and when they play, watch now, when you're watching someone live or you're watching somebody on, 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 on the internet, Notice the hand positions and notice what's propelling that hand position. Yeah. And that's what Gladstone did with fingers. Right. And so this is something that just now it just comes naturally to you when you're actually playing it around the kit. I, I don't think about it. If I need it to work, it just kind of jumps in and does it, much like my conjunctions. I don't think about the conjunction before I use it. Right. I just use it. So when it comes to, like, th there's this exercise, but when it, uh, on the, do you do a pad exercise to develop it further? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and what you can do is you can take a book like Sick Control. And if you take page five, six, and seven, and think of each R as four rights, and each L as four lefts. So number one, which is right, left, right, left, right, left, right, would be right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. And you read those first three pages that way where you're putting four notes, and you can do three notes for each R, four notes for each R, and then five notes for each R and L. Huh. So you're stretching the, the duration of how your fingers work. And if you do this where you're working it, you're literally playing the stroke from your fingers all within, inside the fingers. Right. And it just kind of brings the fingers into the, the game. Yeah. You want to bring this stuff into the game. And there are so hey, listen, you've had some of the best drummers in this room. Yeah. Uh, listen, I'm just honored to be in this room, <laughs> nevertheless, to sit next to you, Jared, because this is so great to be here. With all these great drummers that have been here, watch, go back and watch their movement. That's, that's their sound and their style, and they, right. they use their tools. And the tools, listen, I work on my house. I do some of the crown molding on my house. I like working on my house. No one's ever walked into my house and said, Man, you must have some hammer and screwdriver. Mm -hmm. They've never worked in complimenting the tools. They come in and say, man, what a great feel. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're looking for here, to complement the feel of how you're playing. The tools are something that we work on individually. Right, they're backstage, essentially. Absolutely, yeah. and, and Gladstone taught that. He had fantastic students that were, who had become just you know, brilliant, brilliant artists. Mm -hmm. And all of these teachers, Gladstone, Stone, and Moeller, they taught the best of the best. Right. The Gene Krupas, the Buddy Riches, the Max Roaches, the Elvin Jones, all these guys came out of that, you know, that kind of a foundation of learning. And yeah. when you think about it, all these great drummers that are no longer with us, all lived and played great into their 80s. Right. They never had pain, they never had all the challenges we have, carpal tunnel and, and tennis elbow and rotator yeah. cuff and pain and bad posture, yeah. back, my neck, my knees. Like, I hear more excuses. I feel like a freaking drum chiropractor when they come to me, jeez. <laughs> okay, it's incredible. We, we, have, we have a couple more here to go and then as we have time, I really want you to tell your buddy Rich story when you first uh -huh. met him, if, if you're okay, okay with that. Sure, sure. Okay, so the next one we want to talk about is uh, Stone. 
George Lawrence Stone. So yeah. George Lawrence Stone, again, these guys were born in the 1880s and died in the 1960s. So I never met these guys. 1971, when I got that information from Max, right. these guys were all, all deceased. So when I had said I want to learn these techniques, I said to Max, well, I want to learn those techniques. How do I learn it? He said, you got to find their best students. Yeah. So that's what led me to Shelley Mann under Billy Gladstone. That led me to Morello, the best student under George Lawrence Stone, and Jim Chapin under Moeller. Right. So By now, the way, you have a whole drum teacher lineage. Is this posted on your website? It's on my website, yeah, okay. on my website. I would love to film something with that too. But Go download it and take it for yeah. sure and do something with it. And that lineage is important to have because it just kind of gives the how this information has seeped down yeah. to how I got it and how I teach it to my students in my, in, in my global travels yeah. and how I want this information to be alive. If you want to find out where you're going in this instrument, you got to kind of find out where we came from. Yeah. And when you have a little bit of this knowledge, these guys were brilliant. So if they're brilliant, why would I want to think that I can think of this without them? I want their brilliance. I want yeah. to have that so I can steal from it and learn from it. Yeah. So Stone comes along, lived in Boston, um, not that far from where Stone was in Boston was Morella. Morella came from Springfield, Massachusetts. Right. So that's why Joe found George Lawrence Stone at a young age. And Morella studied with him for many, many years. And George Lawrence Stone, his father, Bart Stone, was a drum manufacturer. And, and his family went back to the Civil War and probably the Revolutionary War as drummers. Mm -hmm. That was their lineage of what they did. They played drums. So George Lawrence Stone took it into a little bit more of the modern sense that he played snare drum mm -hmm. rudimentally and then in theaters and it wasn't really a drum set player until the later part of his life. Mm -hmm. So Stone comes in and, and, and realizes that within this motion, he wants to play this, this concept where many drummers were holding a stick real tight, they'd throw the stick down, and they'd pull it up. Two motions. Mm -hmm. So Stone realized, if I throw it down and use Isaac, uh, Isaac Newton's third law, for every action there was an equal and opposite reaction. Mm -hmm. If he uses that third law, where I throw it down, and I let it fly back into my hand, I'm only throwing it down, and it is falling back into my hand. It's literally jumping back into my hand. That stroke is what Stone called the free stroke, this freedom of movement. I throw it down, it jumps back up. And yeah. that's what I'm doing all around the kit. That's what all these great drummers do. They allow this stick to work with them, so they throw it at the cymbal, and the cymbal comes back to them, and they just think down, and they're throwing down. And when you watch these wonderful players, Tommy Igo was here, he plays beautiful that way in the fact of how he moves around yeah. the kit. That's freedom of expression. Listen, he worked on his technique, and all these guys work on their technique. Yeah. So if somebody wants results without the work, that's a tough one. Yeah. That's a, that, you know, listen, I, I want to have an Arnold Schwarzenegger body. I've never been to a gym. It ain't gonna happen in my lifetime, okay? It ain't gonna happen. I've never even been in a gym. I, I, I once walked past a, 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 a treadmill. I walked past it. I looked at it. That was as far as I got. So it's not gonna happen. So you gotta put that time into it. So Stone came up with this free stroke of throwing it down. So now if I'm playing with this free stroke and I'm allowing this stick to kind of to kind of just dance in my hand, that stick to rebound in my hand. So I'm not really playing every note, I'm kind of guiding yeah. it. Yeah. That's, that's what Stone realized. It's, it's super interesting. And then I think that's the hard part for people to like get to that point where, because they see you going, and they, they see you going like this, and they hear, <laughs> right? And well, so, but that's the secret. You know, go, go watch some of the buddy stuff. Go watch yeah. Max Roach and Elvin play. They're just kind of moving, and, and stuff's happening yeah. all over the place. Yeah. That's very cool. So Stone, Stone figured it out. He figured out this, this, this um, concept of think down, throw it down, allow the rebound of what we have off of the drums and the cymbals to assist you mm -hmm. in this expression. Right. So the free stroke was nothing more than just a concept of movement. Again, relaxed movement, consistent movement, and fluid movement is what we're looking for. Yeah. So if there are times that I use the Gladstone fingers or times I'm using wrists, that's a major part of the process. Mm -hmm. And that's what Moeller came along and, and figured out too. Right, so let's talk about that. That's oh, the last okay. one. Okay, Moeller, Moeller, again, th th these guys, again, Moeller was a rudimental player that, that, that marched in, in, with the John Philip Sousa mm -hmm. band and they needed volume and power. And Moeller studied with these Civil War drummers 
Again, these guys were born in the 1880s. Mm -hmm. You know, in 1895, when when Mola was 14, 15 years old, where do you go to take drum lessons? It's not like you have this available. Right. You, you had to hop on your horse with your drum and ride four or five hours to go to a lesson, and you went to an old soldier's home where an old Civil War drummer was teaching a little, you know, snare drum technique. Yeah. So he went there and learned. And what he noticed with these old guys, they'd walk out. They were old. They were in their 90s. They'd come out. Old men would walk into the room, they'd sit down, they'd give Mola this lesson of all this arc whipping stroke and how they were playing, and then and, and, and then they'd walk back as an old man to their room. So Mola used yeah. to say, this old man came in to give me a lesson, this 90-year-old man, a 20-year-old man gave me the lesson, yeah. and then after the lesson, a 90-year-old man went back to his room. Yeah. So the technique just gave them freedom that as they got older, they played great. Again, all these great drummers that are no longer with us played right till the end. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is deep. I mean, I just turned 65 and I'm still enjoying the freedom of this movement and I'm still as excited about learning it and stepping even further into it mm -hmm. to learn more about what my potential might be. Right. So now with Moeller, Moeller comes in and figures this arc stroke and the stroke is a very, very big arc stroke like this here. Right. Now, some guys will say, Dom, I'm practicing this stroke. When am I ever going to use that? Great question. Maybe never. But watch players like Kenny Yarnoff. Mm -hmm. Watch players like Abe Laboriel Jr. These guys are playing, and when they're playing a backbeat, they are way back here playing that backbeat, mm -hmm. hitting that snare drum to produce the sound they need to fill an arena. Mm -hmm. So listen, we have to hit the drums. Right. We can't turn to a dial and go, oh, you need more volume. Let me step on this dial here. Let me hit this pedal here to give you a boost. We don't have that. You, we have to learn the techniques to hit and, and still maintain a level of relaxation. Right. So Mola comes on, figures a stroke, and gets this stroke, and he's playing all here. Jim Chapin starts studying with him in 1938, and Chapin brought the Mola technique down more. He brought it down to here. So Chapin figured this. Where as if I had this imaginary string on my wrist and I pull it up and the tip of the stick is a thousand pounds and as I do this here, the arc, you can almost kind of see the, you can see the string. Can you, can you see the string, Jared? Yeah, I definitely can see you, it. You can see it, right? Jared, there, there's no string, Jared. It's invisible. It's imaginary. Well, but I that's all right. I was playing. <laughs> so with that motion, it really is that, mo that's the movement. And, that, and Chapin would make me do this in the lesson. Right. Do this. Try to understand the movement of what that would be like. I would, my, my first lesson was doing this in the lesson. We didn't hit the drum, we just did this. When I went home to my parents and they said, wow, Jim Chapin, you studied with this great master. Show us what you learned. And I said, oh, check this out. <laughs> my parents thought I was out of my mind. Well, hit the drum. I said, no, that's the next lesson. <laughs> so it was that motion. So, so Chapin came up with this, this whipping motion with inside triplets or 16th notes. That motion was just loose and relaxed. Right. Watch all these great players. My gosh, I love when, when Vinny Kaliuta's playing and he goes to the bell of the cymbal and you can see that, the way he just attacks it with that slight little whip. Yeah. He gets a sound and a feel that puts him into the movement of the groove. It's like a dance step that allows him to get around the kid. It's really, really beautiful yeah. to watch. Just from a, as, as Jim Chapin used to call it, poetry in motion yeah. is really what it was. So with Mola, it came into this motion here. So in that motion, then Chapin, Kind of figured out playing single stroke, whip, 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 tap, tap, 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 and have this motion where you're totally relaxed. I'm not really, I'm not really working for that. Right. So if I can take that now in that motion and apply it around the drums where I'm playing. So not only am I getting some speed and some power, but I'm still relaxed. Yeah. And inside the groove, I'm playing. Um, also now the. The feel of that motion 
allows me to dance. Right. And dancing is a very a big part of this instrument. To dance is the movement of playing. Watch players like David Garibaldi. Yeah. When he plays, it's like a it's like a dance. If you're not moving when David is playing drums, you're dead. Oh, I just saw them earlier this year, and I was like, again. How great, right? I was like stage side, ten feet away. Oh my I gosh! Was so it, it's, impressed. He, he, and he's getting better and better. Yeah, he is. Forty he years, is. over forty years with that band, yeah. these guys are still kicking it and playing at the top of their game. So that means his technique is working for him, and David is an avid student of the art form. Yes. He takes lessons when he can, he's constantly going through books, yeah. he's, he's constantly, we're talking about new books that came out, we're talking, it's, it's, he's into it. Yeah. So if you are into it and you have a desire to learn, to be the constant learner, yeah. this, is, this is the key, the constant learner. I'm 65, 50 plus years of playing drums, I'm still excited to learn. I believe once you stop learning, that's the kiss of death. Right. That, that means you've, you've, you've maxed your potential. And I don't think there's a, that we should do that to ourselves. Right, and awesome. It's pretty powerful, yeah. Awesome, thank you, man. <laughs> there you go, there's like, I mean, what better lesson could you have than that? Right. These are the building blocks and yeah. the foundation of, of every great drummer, so. And, and, it, it's, and the technique is not about music. Now music, when you start to play music, which is about the expression of what you feel and the mm -hmm. groove and, and playing to a song, we need to have these building blocks to allow us to get to that stage of expression. Right. So without that, when I see drummers playing that are tight and stiff and they're playing and they're, and, and they're tense, I feel for them because they're working so hard to achieve too little. Right. And Morella always said, I want you to learn this free stroke and this molar and these fingers so you can have the maximum results with the least amount of effort. Right. I used to like that. Not that it was an easy way out because you had to put the time into it. Mm -hmm. You had to work for it. But the results are just so exciting and comfortable. Nice, awesome. <laughs> hey man, I'm gonna ask you that now that we've kind of gone through all these techniques, I would love for you to play and for everyone watching, just be able to kind of see as, as you're playing, hey, oh, I see him using Great. that. I see him using this technique, Great the idea. Gladstone, the, 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 this type of thing. I'm back, drums. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna hit each and every one of you, and I don't know what positions I'm gonna play, I'm just gonna play it. Let's see what we have here. I had flashbacks to watching you playing at that Larry London thing because you did the China oh, yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had flashbacks to like dancing <laughs> men, Simon Phillips playing uh, the, the Burning for Absolutely, yeah. Doing yeah. their double bass. And it's a great work, man. Really <laughs> cool work. 
Awesome. Okay. If Buddy Rich. Buddy Rich, and then we, hopefully you can just play one more of these epic. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, real fast, the Buddy Rich story. Yeah. I had a wonderful teacher by the name of Al Miller, mm -hmm. Long Island based teacher. He was a saint of a soul, mm -hmm. a kind man, and he really opened me up to, to ideas of drumming. And uh, one day he said to me, he said, Boy, Dom, you, you're one of my best students. I want you to come over tomorrow night and meet a buddy friend of mine. Mm -hmm. A, a buddy friend of mine. I said, great, why can I bring you? He said, just bring some wine. I said, great. 1971, I'm 18 years old. So I get some wine, you know, and, I, and on my way to his house, there was a great uh, jazz club called Poor Peter's that was really uh, like a block from his house yeah. on the main road. And I saw as I rode by, it said, tonight, the Buddy Rich Big Band. And I went, oh my gosh, I know Al loves Buddy Rich Big Band. So I went in there, stopped, and I bought three tickets front row center. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, man, I'm gonna, Al and his buddy and, and myself, we'll go, well, this will be great, man. We'll go, we'll have a little dinner. I get to Al's house, I knock on the door, he opens the door and I said, Al, have I got a surprise for you? He says, come on in, I've got a surprise for you too. I walk in, give him the wine, I turn to his living room, and on the freaking couch is Buddy Rich. Buddy Rich, it, it, this is like the legend of the legend. He's there, yeah. and Buddy, he was not a tall guy, so I, I, like, I, I towered him, you know? Yeah. So Al says, uh, Buddy, this is that student I said, Dom Familaro, and, uh, and Dom, this is Buddy Rich. So I, 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 I started stammering, I didn't, this, is, this is Buddy Rich. I had just seen him the night before on the Johnny Carson show. He had just played with Frank Sinatra. This guy was the legend's legend. Yeah. So as I'm shaking his hand, I turned to Al and I said, Al, you said I was gonna meet a Buddy friend of yours. This is not a Buddy. This is the buddy. It's a big difference. <laughs> buddy loved that. He loved yeah. that. We sat and had dinner, and we, we, we ate, and, and I just heard them talk, and they were, just, they, were just, they were friends. Buddy looks at us, watches, whoa, man, come on, we gotta go to the gig. He says, come on, we'll take my car. We go to the driveway. He's got a red Corvette Stingray. So he says, uh, Dom, you get in the back seat. Now, if you know a Corvette Stingray, there is no back seat. Yeah. It's like a little crawl space. Yeah. I got in, there's no way, man. I was getting in Buddy's car. Yeah. I get in, my legs are crunched, so I'm kind of like in a contorted position. My foot's out the window, they get in the car. Buddy drove fast. As we're driving, I said, by the way, guys, I, 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 I bought three tickets to this show, front row center. Yeah. So Buddy turns to me and says, well, that was stupid. You're gonna sit backstage with Al. Give me the tickets. So I reach in my pocket while he's driving, I pass the tickets up front. He pulls in front of the theater, there's a lineup of people, but he gets out of the car, walks around to the last three people and says, I'll see you front row center. <laughs> the people like lit up seeing Buddy. He gets back in the car, we drive around backstage, Buddy put two folding chairs on the side of the stage, and then I got the chance to watch Buddy this close, mm -hmm. backstage, so the audience couldn't see Al and I, but we were on a folding chair. And it really, it really was a, a life-changing experience because to sit that close to somebody playing their heart out which seemed to be like an older man. I was 18, he was probably you know, in his right. late 40s at the time. Right. And, and, you know, and when someone's in their late 40s, you think, oh my gosh, this guy's got one foot in the grave yeah, already. Dinosaur you know? This right. guy's totally <laughs> been exactly right. So I realized, I said that now that I'm 65, I, I think I got some days ahead of me with this here. I'm still kind of learning. So to meet him and to hear him and to witness that level of passion and that level of dedication and that level of drum legend you know, status was a memory I will remember for the rest of my life. And all the great drummers that I heard after that, the Max Roaches, the Alvin Jones, the Tony Williams, you know, Papa Joe Jones, Mel Lewis, all these great drummers, which are names that as I say them, do the research, find out who these people were. They all played differently, but they used the same tools. Listen, carpenters use the same tools to build a house. Every house is a little different. Yeah. So the tools that we've learned, the Gladstone, Stone, and Molar, and the different positions of our hands, those are just tools. Use them in a way that you can create your art and set up your set in a way that you want. I set up my drums 12, 10, 16, 14. 12, 10, 16, 14. Why? It's different. Totally, <laughs> because it makes me think differently. <laughs> it, it, it makes me have to, you know, search and find and experiment. And Cobham was the first one to do this year, and, and I, I kind of saw that, and now Kenny Arnoff does it, and, yeah. and we're all kind of experimenting. There are two very important rules when you're setting up your drum set. If you follow these rules, you'll set up your drum set to be an individual. Rule number one, there are no rules. Right. Rule number two, follow rule one. Right. If you do that, all systems go. It's not like you buy a piano and you can say, I'm gonna put the white keys on this side yeah. and the black keys on this side. No, we, we have the chance. So two ride cymbals, so I can play right and left-handed, splash, crash, all this here with the toms allows me 
to step into a world of expression that I'm still learning. Mm. I kind of like that, yeah. that feeling. Awesome. Dom. I'll play? Thank you so much. Jared, Seriously. thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you again to uh, uh, Jim from D'Addario Education Club, yeah. Mapex, Sabian, uh, Evans, Promark, all the, all the guys that have helped us getting the gear here. It, it is a lot more work than everyone thinks to get the right, perfect gear. Yeah. You guys did great. Everything is exactly, yeah. exactly perfect. Yeah, so th thank you, everyone. Thank you to the, the, the Drumeo crew here. Great all, guys. We don't usually and do girls. this. <laughs> yeah, we don't, yeah we, just, we don't usually do this on this day, so we're, we're filming it on a Saturday, which is uh, not normal. So everyone came in, which is great. Nothing in my life has been normal, so this is perfect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, and, so Dom, I, I would love for you to just play us out one more time, and, and, uh, and then hopefully this is the first of many visits. Because uh, everyone's this just is, saying, can you come back? Can you do one every month? Can you do, you know, on and on and on. And the answer is yes. Yeah. I mean, to come back here, it's an easy flight to get here. Yeah. And if we take maybe an area... Yeah. of just talking about maybe Gladstone and come up with exercises and everybody out there, imagine if we did a class where you all had your practice pad in front of you yeah. and as I gave the exercise I showed you, you played along with us. So for this hour of lesson, yeah. we'll work your hands in that hour. I guarantee you, you're gonna feel the we'll difference do that. in that we process. We do practice along. So we'll do it, okay, yeah? Yeah, yeah, so Let's, the students love them. So yeah. boot camps, practice along, challenges, we do, we do them all here. Oh so. man, and I'll come to your house. <laughs> and, 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 listen, basic pasta, red wine, I'm there. <laughs> I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. Okay. All right. Let, let, uh, thanks again, man. And thank you, Jared. Thank you yeah. so much. You've got a great team here in a wonderful situation, and it's inspiring to play here and be a part of it because there is some serious dedication that is going on here. That is all about you. It's all about you. Take the information. Be a part of the drumming community. Go out there and play and to make a difference. And I believe in all of you that you can go out there and find your individual sound. I believe in you. I only ask one thing from you. Prove me right. Prove me right that you can be this next generation to go out there and take drumming well into the 21st century and make a difference. Thanks.